All right, y'all. I wanted to go over some of the main themes of these two articles, slashing towards abstraction and American folk art questions and quandaries. They are both reviews of books that are about folk art, outsider art, that sort of thing. And as such, they offer kind of a good critique of the field in general, not just the approach of the particular writers of the books in question. So, first off, sloshing towards abstraction, which hopefully you have thoroughly had time to kind of read and absorb. Some of you have turned in the writing for this, uh, and others are still working on it, which is fine. Uh, there is a revival in folk and craft that coincides with the Industrial Revolution. As things become mass-produced, there is a new interest in the handmade. So today, you know, everything that you buy at the store, with the exception of some small craft shop, is going to be mass-produced. You have people who work in factories, and they make little widgets and those go on to the next place, right? But they don't make a complete item start to finish that you would then use, right? People today spend their time doing repetitive tasks in factories, making one small part of something. Whereas it used to be that if you wanted a pair of shoes, you would go to the cobbler, you would have your feet measured, and they would make a pair of shoes specifically for you. So people could take pride in the craftsmanship of the work that they did on a daily basis. Uh, that's no longer the case for a lot of occupations, industrial occupations, right? Because you're there to punch a time clock, you might take pride in your work, but you are one small part of a much larger industrial machine rather than being the craftsman who does the whole thing, right, from the get-go uh, until the end. So there becomes more of an interest in the handmade as the handmade becomes more exceptional, right? It becomes more rare and unusual. In America, folk just means common people, right? Uh, there's a restaurant maybe still around called Folks. It used to be called Po Folks. Uh, it just means for regular people, nothing fancy. And that is kind of the backbone of the American experience in theory, right? That's how we all tie together as the melting pot. So the essay slouching towards abstraction emphasizes objects that are made for everyday use and the way that consumers enjoy those things. If you have mass-produced objects, if you can make them appealing and attractive to people, you're more likely to sell them. And then you put them up on a shelf as a souvenir from wherever you went and you bought that thing, and it becomes part of our life. So they can be very decorated, decorative. Uh, they can be sentimental. They could have some sort of logo from Niagara Falls or wherever you got it. But typically those sorts of things are mass-produced objects made for everyday use that we buy because we enjoy them, right? Uh, that is different than a piece of pottery made by a craftsman for a functional use in the traditional sense. But there's a lot of overlap with those things, right? You could still drink out of a Niagara Falls glass as well as a piece of handmade ceramic. And folk objects, folk art objects and craft, tend to emphasize the handmade rather than the mass-produced, right? So a lot of overlap. Kitsch is a German term often associated with mass-produced consumer items made for the marketplace. And the Niagara Falls glass um, that I'm making up, right, as an example, uh, that could be an example of kitsch. Or if you have uh, little precious moment statues of... Uh, big, watery-eyed children doing something sweet. Uh, those are uh, good examples of kitsch. They're meant to kind of tug at the heartstrings. Uh, that is considered to be in a different category than fine art, and it's kind of one part of art, craft, mass-produced objects, that sort of ball of wax. So there has been a lot written about kitsch and how it is different from art. At some point, the mass-produced becomes more popular than the handmade. I don't know exactly when that is, if you wanted to pin it down to a year. But that's certainly the situation that we have today, and it's been this way for a while. Uh, there is a relationship between form and content in art. 
And it's one of the main things about modernism with a capital M, uh, that art period between late 1800s and about 1980. And modernism detaches form from content in an introspective way. Modernism looks at art to find out what art is about. It looks at painting to find out what painting is about, and it kind of takes painting apart bit by bit to get down to the essence of painting. That's the essence of modernism, right? To kind of be reductive, to try to look at the fundamentals of what makes painting painting, what makes sculpture sculpture, that sort of thing. Self-examining. So part of that dialogue with form and content with modernism is embracing the raw, embracing what was thought of as naive, uh, sometimes termed primitive back in the day, uh, the untrained, uh, the art of people that did not go to art school. That becomes more interesting for modern artists when they begin to kind of turn away from traditional academic painting that looks like an illusion or uh, tends to harken up images from ancient Greece or Rome, oftentimes, uh, and leans instead towards the art of people from institutions, uh, such as uh, Art Brut, or the art of Africa, the art of Oceania, uh, various regions around the world that are considered to be non-Western in their artistic tradition. So there's a big influence on modernism, on the abstraction that people often think of with the artwork of the 20th century uh, that comes from non-Western art. It comes from this non-classical, non-academic form of art. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I'm kind of delving into some of the underpinnings of uh, these essays. And... Is much of what modernists embrace better thought of as popular art rather than folk art is a question that stuck out to me as I was reading through this and kind of thinking of what to emphasize. What we think of as Japanese art in the 1800s was not classical Japanese art in the way that we have classical music and statues of the David and Sistine Chapel ceiling painted by Michelangelo. Uh, it's not that sort of thing. It's like comic books. So um, anime today is an extension of that sort of popular Japanese art that was meant for mass consumption. When modernists latched on to these non-Western, non-European art forms, the stuff that was available to them and visually interesting was the equivalent of comic book art. Uh, cartoons, that sort of thing, if you had to put it in today's terms. So not really delving into the history of the Japanese tradition and what it means to be Japanese and the great art forms of Japan, but instead looking at the flat, brightly colored, very graphic, visual art made for regular people and not for the social elite. So popular art, and in this case you could almost call it kitsch, although... It's certainly not quite that. Uh, that is the thing that had such a big influence on Europeans. So these are some ther some terms in uh, slouching towards abstraction that really stuck out to me uh, as things you might want to have a better understanding of. And then American folk art, questions and quandaries. <laughs> 